Hello, we're glad you've joined us for this live webinar, The Microbiome Gut Brain Access, Linking Gastrointestinal and Neurobehavioral Processes and Autism Spectrum Disorder. I am Christina Mahalik of LabRoots, and I'll be moderating this session. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. To learn more, visit labroots.com. Let's get started. You can post questions to the speaker during the presentation while they're fresh in your mind. To do so, simply type them in the Q&A box, which will open when you click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Questions will be answered after the presentation. To enlarge the slide window, click on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you experience technical problems seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the support button found at the top right of the presentation window, or report your problem by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the screen. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your webpage and follow the process of obtaining your credits. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Ruth Ann Luna, PhD, MBASCPCM, Director of Medical Metagenomics, Texas Children's Microbiome Center, Assistant Professor, Pathology and Immunology, Baylor College of Medicine. Dr. Ruth Ann Luna serves as Assistant Professor in the Department of Pathology and Immunology of Baylor College of Medicine and as Director of, the, of Medical Metagenomics within Texas Children's Microbiome Center at Texas Children's Hospital. Dr. D uh, Dr. Luna directs the next generation sequencing efforts of the Texas Children's Microbiome Center and focuses on multi-omic profiling in a variety of body sites and disease populations. Dr. Luna is a member of the Institutional Review Board of Baylor College of Medicine and is active in clinical research. As principal investigator of two ongoing studies, she is exploring the gastrointestinal and neurobehavioral aspects of children diagnosed with autism Autism Spectrum Disorder, ASD, with specific emphases on gut microbiome and metabolome, as well as the impact of antibiotic treatment on the core symptoms of ASD. Once again, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Luna. Dr. Luna, the floor is all yours. Thank you for the introduction, Christina. So to jump right in to quickly review our objectives, we're going to hopefully explain the potential role of the gut-brain axis in autism spectrum disorder. And we're also going to describe how changes in the microbiome may correlate very strongly with changes in the behavioral symptoms associated with ASD. And then finally, we will identify diagnostic and therapeutic potential of microbiome characterization as well as microbial manipulation in the treatment of autism. So our fascination with the microbiome really started well over a decade ago, and this illustration published in Discover in 2007 depicts our various co-inhabitants of our body. At this point, we were just beginning to appreciate that we were less human than we originally thought, with human cells only making up about 10% of the cells in our body, and the remainder of the cells being bacteria, fungi, protists, archaea, and viruses. So early on, we also adopted this fundamental concept that there was a core human microbiome that was influenced by a variety of factors, including lifestyle, environment, even genetics. 
But as the science has evolved, that core continues to shrink as we've discovered more and more variables that contribute to the structure and the dynamic evolution of our microbiomes. So this shrinking core microbiome is due in part to healthy or normal looking very different depending on your location in the world. The greatest degree of resolution can actually be seen when diving deeper into not just specific diseases, but actual subtypes within a disease population. And more robust microbial profiles have been identified with this approach. It's also difficult to accurately identify a truly healthy control population. So the definition of healthy in clinical research is really just the exclusion of a finite list of issues. In addition, it's not always ethically possible to obtain that ideal healthy control cohort. So we continually have to focus on the selection of the most appropriate control cohort that's available and simply keep these inherent limit limitations in the comparison population in mind. It's also important to note that our expl exploration of the microbiome reaches far beyond simply determining bacterial composition. Bacterial diversity has become a key component of our comparisons with decreases in bacterial diversi diversity commonly associated with a variety of disease states. And beyond community structure, it's really the function of that community that remains the most important piece. So to briefly tell you a little bit about how we do what we do if you're not familiar with microbiome techniques, the first thing we do is extract bacterial DNA from a variety of different specimen types. When we're talking about characterization of the gut microbiome, that is most often a stool specimen. We then amplify the 16S rRNA gene, which is important because it's present in all bacteria. With the 16S rRNA gene, we actually capitalize on the alternating conserved and variable regions within that gene, thus allowing us to utilize universal primers in those conserved regions to theoretically amplify any bacteria in the sample and then sequence directly into the variable regions that allows us to differentiate between the various organisms. We then perform next generation sequencing, and this can be done on a variety of different sequencing platforms, and finally perform in-depth analysis to potentially identify specific disease signatures. Once we have these millions of sequences, we then quality filter and group sequences into clusters that show greater than 97% similarity. During this process, we're also able to parse sequences back into their original sample IDs based on unique barcode sequences that were attached during the amplification phase. We also take the representative sequences from each of the clusters and attempt to identify them to the lowest taxonomic level possible, and then move on to conduct various comparisons via multiple bioinformatic approaches. So clusters of sequences that are greater than 97% similar are referred to as operational taxonomic units, or OTUs, and they roughly represent a bacterial species. Beyond identification of individual community members, we also evaluate the overall community composition. So for instance, if you look at the two boxes there in the center of the slide, you'll see that both theoretical communities share the same community members, meaning the same five different colors of bacteria are present in both boxes. But the community on the right is heavily skewed toward the purple bacteria, and thus would represent a community with decreased bacterial diversity compared to the community on the left. And from there, most of our analyses involve comparisons within samples, subjects, and groups, as well as between samples, subjects, and groups. So all of those basic techniques were also employed in the Human Microbiome Project, which of course was our effort to characterize the healthy human adult microbiome across 18 different body sites. The results of that study confirmed our hypotheses in that composition, bacterial diversity, and relative abundance differ based on body site. We also quickly learned that the microbiome continued to evolve throughout the course of a lifetime with a variety of factors affecting changes in the microbial community. This is actually a terrific graphic to represent these changes. And for those of you that are not as entrenched in microbiome research, it's worth pointing out that the changes represented in this figure are at a very high level, the phylum level in this case. Many of the earlier publications in microbiome science characterized communities at these higher taxonomic levels. 
but with improvements in sequencing technology and bioinformatics strategies and database curation, we're now able to routinely identify sequences to the genus and sometimes even species level. So to put that in perspective, you see here bacteria at the kingdom level with phylum just below that. In order to differentiate between ourselves and the common house cat, we'd have to move down to the order level. So again, many of these comparisons have revealed very distinct microbiomes in a very high level. So once we were able to routinely characterize the healthy human microbiome, the next logical question was whether we could use microbiome profiles to differentiate between a healthy and a diseased state. And the answer, of course, was a resounding yes, especially with regards to the gut microbiome and GI-based diseases. With the discovery of these varying microbiomes, we then began to question whether we could manipulate the microbiome to restore a disease state to a healthy state. And if that was successful, could those improvements actually extend beyond the gut? And that's a question that we're still working to answer. I think it's worth mentioning at this point that we're rapidly moving towards utilizing microbiome characterization as a clinical tool. We don't envision this as a standalone assay, but rather a companion diagnostic to be viewed in light of routine clinical laboratory testing and the complete clinical picture. These evaluations could be highly useful in difficult to treat cases as well as for longitudinal monitoring during treatment. We've seen evidence of its utility in predicting treatment success, specifically in our ability to assess pre-intervention microbiomes, where we've seen specific profiles associated with responders to a dietary intervention in pediatric irritable bowel syndrome. Similarly, we believe that longitudinal characterization of the microbiome could yield important information related to prognoses, and we've utilized this approach in the monitoring of our pediatric recurrent C. difficile patients who are actually undergoing fecal microbiota transplantation. And while many of our original studies sought to capture a snapshot of the microbial community in a single specimen, several of our current efforts have actually moved towards axes-based approaches. And one example of that is the exploration of gut-lung crosstalk in patients with cystic fibrosis. So there's initial evidence that chronic respiratory pathogens may in fact colonize the gut prior to the first acute lung infection, thus serving as a potential canary in a coal mine and possibly allowing for better preparation of the lungs in anticipation of the infection. And of course, our major topic of this webinar, the gut-brain axis, where there's now mounting data supporting the impact of microbial manipulation on behavioral disorders, including autism spectrum disorder. So all of us leaves us with the proverbial chicken or the egg question. Does it all start or end in the gut? So there are really three critical considerations regarding crosstalk between the gut and the brain. And you can see all of these depicted here in this slide from Nature. The first is related to the production of neurotransmitters, which of course 95% of the body's serotonin is actually produced within the gut. So the gut microbiome also has the potential to impact the immune system by eliciting the production of cytokines that can then of course influence neurophysiology. And finally, the active metabolites produced by specific gut microbiomes can affect activity at the blood-brain barrier. So these all represent key areas of focus for us in regard to the microbiome gut-brain axis in autism. So while the previous slide showed you the basics of the gut-brain axis, here you see a far more intricate depiction of the variety of interactions happening along this axis. The most important piece to remember is, of course, communication is bidirectional. And so changes on either end of the axis will induce changes throughout a variety of pathways. So there have been many compelling studies regarding the ability to affect behavior by microbial manipulation. Specifically here, you can see many examples of this via antibiotic or probiotic administration in animal models of both anxiety and depression. But as you can imagine, clinical studies in human subjects have been more sparse. But evidence is growing regarding the impact of the microbiome on brain function, as illustrated by this study, where healthy women were given a probiotic drink for just four weeks. 
and resting state MRI actually showed alterations in the areas of the brain responsible for central processing of emotion and sensation. But now we'll really focus more closely on the microbiome gut-brain axis in autism. We know that there are multiple factors contributing to gastrointestinal and behavioral issues in autism spectrum disorder. And it's easy to envision a never-ending cycle where a child with sensory issues then withholds stool, leading to bloating and abdominal pain. If the child has difficulty communicating, then this could lead to expressing their pain via self-injurious behavior. And then the stress of that situation could then cause even greater gastrointestinal distress. Now, if you've tuned into this webinar, you most likely are very familiar with autism. It's just worth noting that although we've yet to identify a singular cause of autism, there remains a set of core ASD symptoms that manifest from a variety of potential causes, thereby suggesting that there could be common broken pathways. So while parents have reported gastrointestinal issues in autism for years, it's only been fairly recently recognized as an actual symptom, symptom of autism spectrum disorder. So these symptoms can range from constipation to diarrhea to even an alternating phenotype, and there are a variety of different dietary interventions that have been suggested. This brings me to a key problem in autism research. The vast majority of ASD clinical research has utilized an inclusion criteria that is simply a diagnosis of ASD. And we know that the ASD population differs greatly from one individual to the next. And it is this heterogeneity that makes it very difficult to gauge whether treatments are effective for specific symptoms of autism spectrum disorder. If we could better subtype the larger ASD population, for example, with multi-omic profiles that we are hoping to generate from our research, then treatment could be better tailored to the challenges of each individual on the spectrum. In the meantime, it's still highly likely that many of these failed interventions may in fact be effective in a carefully selected subset within the larger spectrum. We know that limited communication can lead to poorly managed abdominal pain, which can in turn can exacerbate behaviors such as self-injury. We hope to identify biomarkers that are associated with abdominal pain in ASD, as well as identify specific gastrointestinal and behavioral phenotypes within autism. In combination with the microbiome and metabolome, these multi-omic profiles have significant potential to be highly useful in the diagnosis and in the effective ongoing management and treatment of autism. So I want to start at the beginning with what I see as the birth of microbiome research in autism. It begins with a mom by the name of Ellen Bolte who saw significant improvements in her child with autism while on antibiotics. She sought out physicians and scientists to further investigate this phenomenon. And this led to a small yet highly impactful trial published over 15 years ago. The greatest strength of this trial was in the strict inclusion criteria, which effectively selected a small group of children with non-syndromic autism who were more severely affected and had associated GI symptoms. This intervention included administration of vancomycin, and the majority of children displayed significant improvements in their symptoms while on antibiotics. These improvements did in fact wane following discontinu discontinuation of vancomycin, but nevertheless, this study really set the stage for an exciting area of future research. The Feingold group went on to further characterize the differences in the gut bacteria in these children with autism and identified several clostridia of interest. And then they went on to develop a potential diagnosis for the quantitation of these key bacteria. This work also included the discovery of a novel species, which was then named Clostridium boltiae after Ellen Bolte. Fast forward 15 years and history repeats itself. A father in this case, John Rodakis, reported the same improvement in his son with autism while on a typical course of antibiotics, and again sought out physicians and scientists who were willing to pursue this area of research. This effort included Mr. Rodakis creating the N of 1 Autism Research Foundation, which is heavily focused on the functional microbiome in autism spectrum disorder. Luckily, the role of the gut microbiome in autism has gained significant interest over the past three to four years. This is largely due in part to a seminal paper published in 2013 describing the potential therapeutic effect of a probiotic on the core symptoms of autism. 
This study utilized the maternal immune activation model of ASD. And this is a model with huge significance since it requires no underlying genetics for the manifestation of an ASD-like phenotype in the offspring of mothers where an antimicrobial response is induced during key developmental windows. Here they documented gut dysbiosis, increased intestinal permeability, and of course symptoms associated with autism spectrum disorder. Then with administration of a probiotic, in this case Bacteroides fragilis, they demonstrated correction of GI dysfunction. But what truly elevated this study was the remarkable changes they reported in behavior with global improvements in all areas except for social deficits. In a more recent study, a maternal high fat diet was utilized to induce an ASD-like phenotype in offspring. With the use of another probiotic, in this case lactobacillus reuteri, social gains were observed along with the restoration of oxytocin levels. So while the prior study focused on diet in the mother, these next two studies focus on diet in the offspring. The ketogenic diet has been employed in individuals with epilepsy for many years, and more recently, animal models of ASD have shown potential benefit in the treatment of core symptoms of autism. With the BTBR model, improvements in sociability and communication coincided with decreases in self-directed behavior. Further evaluation of the gut microbiome revealed that the ketogenic diet decreased total bacterial load along with many other changes, including a decrease in clostridium. A very recent publication also used the ketogenic diet, this time in the MIA mouse model, and again showed significant improvements in sociability with decreases in self-restricted behaviors. So now we've talked about antibiotics, we've talked about probiotics and diet. How about throwing the whole kitchen sink in with fecal microbiota transplantation? So Arizona State recently completed a trial that utilized microbiota transfer therapy, as they referred to it, for the treatment of autism spectrum disorder. This trial recruited children ages 7 to 17, and because they required participants to fully consent to the study protocol, the study was skewed toward the milder end of the autism spectrum. The findings of this study were just published last month and the initial results are very encouraging. The protocol included two weeks of vancomycin, followed by eight weeks of either oral or rectal administration of material, and the participants were then followed for eight additional weeks after discontinuation of therapy. And as hoped, significant improvements in gastrointestinal symptoms were observed in 16 of the 18 participants that completed the protocol. In addition, they were also able to capture global improvements in many of the core symptoms of autism spectrum disorder. And as they reported no adverse events, this certainly sets the stage for future microbial therapy trials in autism. So to review, we have several options for microbial manipulation, whether it's a single offense with antibiotics, defense with probiotics, or a complete community transplant via FMT. Above all, it's important to remember that our ultimate goal is to restore function to the gut microbiome. And with that in mind, we're rapidly integrating metabolomics into our studies of the gut microbiome. Now to briefly review a few of the previously published studies on the gut microbiome and autism. The first study to utilize next generation sequencing was again Feingold's laboratory, and this was published in 2010. Here, they actually stratified based on severity in a small cohort, but did in fact identify a distinct microbiome in the ASD group, again via next generation sequencing for the first time. In a subsequent study by Gondalia et al., a larger cohort failed to reveal differences associated with ASD. However, there was a major confounder in that they utilized neurotypical siblings as controls, and it's likely that shared genetics and environment would decrease the potential resolution of these findings. And with this more recent publication from Kang et al., we continue to have conflicting results on the gut microbiome in ASD, with this study seeming to confirm distinct microbial differences between the ASD and neurotypical cohorts. 
The publication by DeAngelis et al. was smaller in terms of total numbers and excluded per gastrointestinal issues. However, the inclusion of an intermediate group with PDD-NOS, or pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified, rather than just an ASD and sibling group, provides interesting insight into those key differences in the ASD group beyond other developmental delays. And then once again, we have more conflicting findings with yet another study by Sun et al. failing to find a difference between the ASD group and neurotypical siblings. But again, the inclusion of an unrelated neurotypical group could have yielded additional intriguing data. So to visually summarize, this is an excellent graphic published in a recent review that illustrates the range of findings regarding the gut microbiome in autism. And as you can see, these findings vary even at the phylum level. To summarize these studies in a different way, here are the majority of studies that have utilized next generation sequencing in the characterization of the gut microbiome in autism spectrum disorder. Now, if you search PubMed, you'll get numerous results on the topic, but the majority are in fact reviews. We're guilty of it as well, leaving only a handful of studies to lay the groundwork in this area. Each study, of course, has limitations, and when viewing this body of research as a whole, we began to envision a study that would tackle as many of those limitations as possible. And so two years ago, we began a large national study funded by Autism Speaks and with additional recruitment sites at UT Southwestern and Nationwide Children's Hospital to characterize the gut microbiome and metabolome in children with autism. To address some of these prior limitations in the field, we required all the children participating with, AS, with ASD to have an ADOS-confirmed ASD diagnosis. And on the flip side of that, we've also implemented a screen to rule out the potential diagnosis of ASD in both siblings and unrelated neurotypical controls. We're collecting extensive gastrointestinal-based data in the hopes of more accurate stratification based on GI phenotype. And we've included neurotypical children with functional GI disorders as well. In addition, we've now instituted a three-month waiting period following any antimicrobial use, and of course, including antibiotics, antifungals, and antivirals. Ultimately, we hope to recruit close to 400 children and then perform in-depth multi-omic analysis that includes integration of gastrointestinal, behavioral, and clinical data with the gut microbiome and metabolome. So our multi-omic profile includes gastrointestinal phenotype via diaries that capture pain, stooling patterns, and dietary intake, as well as evaluation based on ROM3 criteria and the GI severity index score. We're also obtaining multiple behavioral surveys, as well as a stool specimen for microbiome and metabolome characterization. As I mentioned, we're collecting a series of behavioral surveys, so we also hope to be able to characterize participants based on potential severity and problem behaviors potentially associated with gastrointestinal pain, such as self-injury. With complete multi-omic profiling, we hope to provide further insight into potential treatment options. And here we have an example of that application. We performed integrated analysis of microbiome and metabolome data on children with irritable bowel syndrome who were undergoing a dietary intervention. In this case, it was the FODMAPS diet. Based on their pre-diet change stool specimen, we could predict responders to the diet by their multi-omic profiles. You can imagine how impactful this could be in the autism community, where there are multiple dietary interventions in use with varying degrees of success. Similarly, our prior work in pediatric IBS identified specific bacteria that were associated with abdominal pain, and the detection of these key organisms could aid in the identification of abdominal pain in individuals with limited verbal abilities. So to briefly go back to prior studies on the gut microbiome and ASD, there was in fact a single study by Williams et al. that utilized gastrointestinal biopsies. And while the number of subjects is small, it's very difficult to obtain these types of specimens. And thus the findings remain highly relevant, especially in light of their report of increased clostridiales in the ASD group. 
So in collaboration with Kent Williams at Nationwide Children's Hospital, we're now publishing a second study that's currently in press of the mucosal microbiome and autism spectrum disorder. We included a total of 35 children, ages 3 to 18, who were undergoing lower endoscopy. We were actually able to capture six neurotypical children without functional GI disorders because while their endoscopy was clinically indicated, the results revealed simply benign rectal bleeding. We also had serum collected, allowing for the measurement of serotonin and inflammatory cytokines. So at the top, you'll see separation of groups via principal component analysis, with the ASD group clearly separating from the two neurotypical groups. And as we dug deeper into the composition of the microbial communities, we found that that separation was driven most heavily by differences in clostridiales. And this is a finding that echoed, echoed several of the prior studies in ASD. As you see here, the top graphs depict those organisms that were significantly different between the groups. And you'll notice several clostridium, as well as Lachna clostridium voltiae, as originally discovered by Sid Feingold. The graphs below display those organisms that were most closely associated with pain, particularly in the ASD group. And again, you see multiple clostridiales implicated. So while we saw clear separation between the, the ASD and neurotypical groups, thus identifying a distinct microbe neuroimmune profile in ASD individuals with functional GI disorders, we were also able to differentiate within the ASD group based on the presence of abdominal pain. In addition, many of these organisms were associated with the serotonin pathway as well as correlated with multiple inflammatory cytokines. To look at this in more detail, here you see the specific organisms linked to ASD, as well as two organisms found in increased abundance in the neurotypical with functional GI disorder group. You can also see the potential connections to the serotonin pathway, as well as the many inflammatory cytokines that are correlated with these key clostridiales. So the correlation of multiple microbes with inflammatory cytokines has proved very compelling, as increased cytokines have been previously reported in non-syndromic and or regressive autism. Increased inflammatory cytokines have also been associated with the more severe end of the spectrum, including those with significant communication difficulties and aberrant behaviors. So this leads me again to my central theme, that accurate subtyping of autism spectrum disorder will lead to more robust clinical research and ultimately more effective treatment strategies. And we hope that our work in multiomic profiling in the gut and ASD will contribute greatly to that effort. So the last piece I want to cover involves a longitudinal case study. This specific case study was included as part of our larger GI study in ASD. But here we take a single family who collected daily stool specimens on the ASD child while completing the two-week protocol and associated diaries, questionnaires, etc. So in addition to a neurotypical sibling, we were also able to compare against five unrelated age and sex-matched healthy neurotypical controls. Here you can see clear separation of all the specimens collected from the child with ASD from both the neurotypical sibling and other unrelated neurotypical controls. Now let me take an interesting aside here. Thinking back to the original vancomycin trial initiated by Ellen Bolte, this case study seems to fit their strict inclusion criteria with normal neuroanatomy, non-syndromic ASD, the manifestation of GI symptoms prior to an ASD diagnosis, and generally on the more severe end of the spectrum. I'd also like to bring up melatonin at this point. We know this is widely used in the ASD community in the treatment of sleep difficulties, and again, with varying success. So we're not actively tracking participants who, one, take melatonin, and two, experience significant improvement in sleep patterns while on it. Now, why is melatonin relevant? Well, as you probably already know, moving further down the serotonin pathway brings you to melatonin. So again, we have more compelling leads to continue to pursue along that microbiome gut-brain axis. But back to the case study, here you see the microbiome profiles across the entire two weeks for the child with ASD along with the single profile for the neurotypical sibling at the far right end. This includes two samples from day eight on the ASD child where there was a significant change in stooling pattern from morning to evening. 
You may also spot two areas within this graph that appear to represent a change in the microbiome. And these two periods of time actually coincided with gastrointestinal episodes, the first of which resulted in abdominal pain as well as diarrhea, and the second of which caused abdominal pain but didn't seem to result in a change in stooling pattern. Now, because this child was in full-time behavioral therapy, we were actually able to capture data on self-injurious behaviors as well over the course of these two weeks. And this basically led us to observe the trifecta of behavioral exacerbations, gastrointestinal symptoms, and an altered gut microbiome. Looking more closely at the specific ASD microbiome, we again saw many bacteria previously reported in ASD, including Clostridium boltiae and multiple other Clostridiales that we observed in the ASD cohort of the mucosal microbiome study that I just discussed. These organisms were also absent or significantly decreased in the sibling as well as in the unrelated neurotypical controls. So one unexpected finding was the detection of Haemophilus parainfluenzae, generally a respiratory pathogen, but we'd previously reported this organism in children with irritable bowel syndrome. However, in this longitudinal case study, Haemophilus interestingly spikes during both of the GI episodes, with a more pronounced appearance in the diarrheal episode and actually in the diarrheal specimen. We definitely confirm the absence of any typical bacterial or viral pathogen during those T2 GI episodes by running it through a clinical diagnostic, diagnostic GI panel. And we're continuing to evaluate the potential role of Haemophilus or potentially other organisms during each of those two gastrointestinal events. Finally, we've also performed global metabolomic profiling on these samples and have a multitude of interesting findings that we're still working our way through. For example, you see here Homo arginine appears to spike the morning of the first GI episode, but butyroglycine spikes later in the, in the day at the onset of the diarrheal episode. We also saw consistent decreases in several fatty acids in the ASD samples compared to the neurotypical controls and neurotypical sibling. But our work continues in creating a comprehensive data set for the exploration of the gut microbiome and autism spectrum disorder. We are also currently recruiting for an additional study supported by the N of 1 Autism Research Foundation to evaluate the effect of effects of antibiotics on both the gastrointestinal and behavioral symptoms of autism spectrum disorder. This requires participants to complete a baseline study, and then upon prescription of antibiotics by their regularly treating physicians, they would provide another stool specimen, complete a series of surveys over the next two weeks, and then provide a second stool specimen once antibiotic therapy is discontinued. While we are not prescribing antibiotics, this trial will allow us to observe the microbial and functional changes caused by antibiotics and autism spectrum disorder, as well as the impact on behavioral symptoms, with the hopes that these data will provide direction on future therapeutic options. So to summarize, there's clear evidence of bidirectional communication across the gut-brain axis via the central enoteric nervous systems, and the gut microbiome plays a key role in that relationship. We know that more large, well-controlled studies are needed, and we're currently working towards that goal. In the meantime, we do think there's significant utility in microbiome characterization as a potential future diagnostic and in individual case studies, including longitudinal samples, especially in difficult to treat cases and whether that difficulty is on the gastrointestinal or behavioral side. And finally, while there are multiple new promising areas of research regarding the functional microbiome and immune system in ASD, microbial manipulation remains a therapeutic option worth exploring. So with that, I'll acknowledge my team here within the Texas Children Microbiome Center, as well as my, my laboratory in medical metagenomics, our collaborators throughout the hospital, as well as Kent Williams at Nationwide Children's, and then our funding support from both the N of One Autism Research Foundation and Autism Speaks. And now I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Luna, for your uh, informative presentation. A quick reminder for our audience on how to submit questions. 
simply type them in the Q&A box found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. And Dr. Luna will answer as many questions as time permits. So without hesitation, let's jump in to our Q&A portion. Dr. Luna, our first question of the day uh, asks, can specialized diets improve symptoms associated with autism? So in terms of specialized diets, we know there have been prior trials that have failed to identify a significant improvement in symptoms while on something like the gluten-free, casein-free diet. But as I mentioned during the presentation, without the ability to effectively subtype within the larger spectrum of autism, it's completely unknown as to whether these diets may have significant impact on specific individuals with autism. So with that, we basically look to each family and each individual with autism to perform their own evidence-based medicine trial, their N of 1 trial, to determine whether specific elimination diets or changes in the diet do elicit positive benefits in their child with autism. So we absolutely think there's huge potential in a variety of specialized diets, and you just need to try out several with your child and try to have an unbiased way to track changes in their behavior and potential improvements and move on from there. So this is a question that we get quite frequently. In the initial days of our study, we were trying to stick to the three recruitment sites, but as we've expanded, we are now able to recruit nationally, both for the larger autism GI multi-omic profiling study and for the specific antibiotics study. We've now, I think, perfected our ability to ship materials back and forth to families, so you will be able to participate remotely, and again, both of those trials are still open for participants, and you're welcome to contact me if you're interested in participating in either of those studies. Thank you, Dr. Luna. Um, our third question of the day asks, should all children with ASD be evaluated by a gastroenterologist? So this is something that we've addressed quite a bit within our own internal group of autism researchers here. There are many indications for individuals with autism to see a gastroenterologist, and these indications are not always obvious to caregivers. We definitely think it's worth at least having an initial visit with a gastroenterologist to discuss potential issues. One of the most common symptoms in ASD is constipation and functional constipation, and this could definitely be contributing to potential abdominal pain and, again, unreported abdominal pain that could be exacerbating severe behaviors in that child with ASD. So we definitely think it's worth at least an initial consultation with the gastroenterologist knowing how prevalent many of these GI issues are within that pediatric ASD population. Thank you, Dr. Luna. Um, thank you for your presentation. It doesn't appear that we have any additional questions at the moment. So I would like to thank you again for your presentation. Do you have any final comments that you would like to leave us with today? Thanks, Christina. I'd just like to thank you for the opportunity to present this research. We're very excited about the direction the field is moving, and we're doing our best with these larger studies to continue to contribute to that body of knowledge. And again, if you're interested in participating in any of these studies, you're more than welcome to contact me. My email is raluna, R-A-L-U-N-A, at bcm.edu, so Baylor College of Medicine.edu. And once again, thank you for listening. Once again, thank you for your time. I'd like to thank the audience as well for joining us today and thank Lab Roots for today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand through May 2017. 
Labyrinths will alert you via email when it is available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. This is Christina with Labroots wishing you a great day. We hope to see you here again soon at labroots.com. Goodbye.